I just ran down the stairs to get a drink and I am still out of breath, but here we are. Hey spuds, it's Jamie, welcome back to another video for us on our channel. I don't know, but welcome either way. I'm sorry if I sound a bit snotty today. It's because I am. I don't think I'm ill. It's just happening. I don't know why, but welcome. Hello, I'm very glad to have you here. Today we're doing a video that I have been putting off for a while because I just haven't felt like doing it. Don't know if I feel like doing it today, I'm not sure. But today we're gonna to be watching a anti-trans documentary called D-Trans. I mean, the whole title just irritates me. I don't know why. It's just an annoying title. And it was made by PragerU. Some of you may have heard of PragerU, some of you may have not. They are a very right-wing American-based thing that is not a university, despite being called Prager University. They are not part of an educational establishment, and they are not an educational establishment, and they do a lot of right-wing type political videos and posts and things, and they also spread a lot of transphobia, this documentary being quite a prime example of that. You may have heard of it because PragerU really wanted you to hear about it, in the sense that they put a lot of ad spend behind sharing this documentary. PragerU buys takeover ad on X as part of one million dollar campaign to promote polarizing D-trans film. X users had a variety of reactions to the ad, and the film which centers on the stories of two adults who previously identified as transgender. I remember seeing the ad, I remember seeing the little, like, it came up on like a trending tab or something on X, Twitter, whatever. It was just there all the time for ages. You couldn't go on X without seeing the trailer for this documentary, and it was very frustrating. <laughs> so I wanted to go through a couple bits of like articles and things written about it, uh, just to give you a background of what it's about, and then we're gonna watch it. It's PragerU's latest documentary is about a small handful of people who transitioned as young people and then decided to detransition later. This film is not trending because people love or hate it, by the way, Prager, you reportedly paid X $1 million to shove its agenda into everyone's faces. This tactic should be terrifying to anyone who values speech because it essentially boils down to a massive misinformation campaign. Although people who detransition certainly exist and are entitled to sharing their story, they account for only about 1% of all trans people. Around 1% of people who transition later go on to regret it. That's a very, very low regret rate. A spokesperson said, We put so many resources behind promoting detrans because it is one of the most important projects we have ever done. PragerU spokesperson said over email after I asked why they decided to put so much muscle behind this campaign specifically. We are doing everything we can to reach a massive audience on the dangers of gender affirming care as it has rapidly become a social contagion that has detrimental consequences. You just know from like this tiny little description the fact that they put such high ad spend behind X specifically says a lot. The fact that they see transitioning as a social contagion says a lot. The angle they took when exploring detransition says a lot. The, it's not to say that detransitioning should never be explored, never have airtime. It should. It's not a threat to the trans community that some people, one to under 1% regret and will later detransition. That doesn't threaten the trans community. Compared to general medical statistics on regret from procedures and medical steps people have taken for various various things, that's very, very low in terms of regret rate. The 21 minute film focuses on two people who have detransitioned, meaning they previously identified as transgender and later decided they were not. Though both of them began transitioning when they were adults, their stories are part of the film's larger criticism of transition related care for minors, which has recently become the target of Republican state legislators, who have passed laws to restrict puberty blockers, hormone therapy and surgery in 22 states over the last three years. Horrendous. So very much, uh, I think we can all get an idea of what this is gonna be about. I thought we could just watch it together and have a little reaction. I just wanted to give you some background first to let you know what you're in store for and also to let myself know because I kind of knew what it was about, but I wanted to read some stuff about it first. So yeah, let's go. Shall we? Shall we do this? Yeah, we're gonna do this. Okay. This is Courage, and he's going to pull me through. Okay, Courage. All right. Pull me, Courage. Pull. Pull. You want to be... You want I really am sad that I took my voice for granted. Like, I didn't just take it for granted. I hated it. Like, and now, like, I would go, I would do anything to have that voice again. I feel like it's a bit odd showing, uh, 
video of a young child and young children have voices that are much higher pitched than adults anyway regardless of level of testosterone so it would kind of be a bit difficult to go back as an adult to have the voice you had when you were 10 but sure okay i'm going to assume this is somebody who took testosterone and regretted it Our goal here is to offer gender-affirming therapy. There is a substantial body of research that shows these treatments Treatment work. Treatment for gender dysphoria is proven to be life-saving medical care. It really comes down to how uncomfortable with their body parts. Deciding to permanently alter the body. And do they want to change those body parts? What do their doctors know? Who's there for their detransitioning? Nobody. Not children have already been victimized by this barbaric suicide. Ridiculous. My childhood was ruined. This needs to stop. We have a serious problem. That's quite an intense series of intro clips. Everything they were showing about transition statistics and the research behind it and the evidence behind it is all true. It is the gender affirmative approach is the approved approach at treating gender dysphoria and, and trans people. That's not to say there aren't ever doctors that act in bad faith with any type of medical field, medical procedure, medical journey. Not all doctors are perfect and not all doctors are good. And it's not to say that everybody always makes the right decision for themselves or knows exactly what they need but it is still the approved approach we're talking about a one percent regret rate here we can't punish the 99 percent because of the one percent so to kind of follow that up with a lot of very like inflammatory like ruining childhoods and dangerous and blah 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 it's it's tricky because like the stats behind that just don't evidence what people are saying there's there's not that same body of research that same level of evidence to back up these very very dangerous claims of gender affirmative care being dangerous because it doesn't exist because it's not dangerous d trans are dangerous of gender affirming care he was like this boy that I, like customized in my mind of like the ideal boy other girls looked so different than i did they were you know expressing themselves very differently i was depressed hopeless and i was feeling pretty dejected and scared and alone he didn't like life like i just wanted to stay in my room all day As you spiral into depression, it really feels like you're in a hole that is so infinitely deep. And the depression just was really debilitating in that I didn't really care about self-worth is not a real thing. Improving myself because I already felt like I was just like I shouldn't have been born. Just having really like dark thoughts. I always just felt very much like there was just something wrong with me and I was trying to figure it out, and I used the internet to help me do that. I kind of, like, I'm getting the vibe of where this is gonna go, and I, I want to make it clear that the things that I'm, I'm likely gonna say and the pushback against this documentary and the claims that I'm assuming they're gonna make, but we're gonna wait and see, is not because I have a problem with people detransitioning or with detransitioners, because I absolutely don't. They've gone on their own journey, they deserve support, and they are not a threat to the trans community. I don't have an issue or a bad word or bad feelings towards people who detransition, as a lot of transphobes would want people to believe that trans people are like, no, detransitioners, we hate them all. No, we really don't. There's not animosity between trans people and detransitioners, unless detransitioners start then being proponents against gender affirmative care and start being transphobic themselves and taking taking part in things like this. I'm interested to see if the detransitioners themselves who took part in this documentary are sharing transphobic rhetoric or if their stories have just been twisted into a transphobic documentary, if that makes sense. Like, were they aware that their participation was going to be used in this way? I'm curious. That's where I felt like I could diagnose myself. My favorite websites were YouTube and Tumblr. I really <laughs> It's such a huge amount of content that I consumed at that time. I mean, I watched a lot of trans people. I watched a lot of, you know, gender transformation videos and saw these people really just like go from female to male visually. Like they looked like men. And I was like, whoa, I didn't even know that it was possible for a woman to pass as a man that well. It's really dark when you think about it. That's really interesting phrasing though, because I feel like they've essentially just said 
that trans men are women because like they're saying they're watching trans men transitioning physically and like taking testosterone surgery that kind of thing and then being like very easily identifiable as like stereotypically like man looking if that makes sense but they're saying they didn't know that it, a woman could look like a man but trans men aren't women who look like men trans men are men because the people who are consuming this are children like 13 14 15 years old and it's so easy for them to literally be groomed i just started looking into all of it i was like oh okay I feel like this suddenly just went down the route of, right, their participation hasn't been twisted to be transphobic, that's just the viewpoint they're coming at. I think that that is such a dangerous statement to throw out there and something that is not true. We have people sharing their experiences and, like, the whole, like, children being groomed by trans people and, and that being the sentiment here is exactly what was said about gay people 20 years ago, that they were coming after the children and trying to make Make them gay or other horrible things that just aren't true and it's like oh it that's really uncomfortable because the trans community is a community that has been so like pushed down and so underground for ever like <laughs> when you see it it's it's like these one-off big stories and it was major major news that there, there was a trans person that existed and now we have the internet and people are able to share their stories and give representation. Representation and sharing of stories does not equate to grooming or malicious influence or making people be a certain way. I think it's very, it's a big leap to conflate those two things. There's gender queer, gender fluid, there's agender, there's like, you can be a demi-girl, which is when you're like 90% girl, 10% not girl. Like, there's just an infinite amount of ways that you can interpret and express your own gender identity and your gender identity is who you are and nobody gets to take that away from you. So hearing that, I just became very, very interested in having a male persona. I don't know if it's the way they're talking about it now in hindsight of having now detransitioned or if that's how they always felt, but if they always had a perspective of trans men are just women who look like men and I want to have a male persona, that's very, very different to trans people's experiences of gender identity and transitioning. Because if you spoke to a trans man like me, it wouldn't be, I'm a woman who looks like a man, it would be, I am a man because I am and to call me a woman would be wrong and I didn't want a male persona it's just that that is who I am it's not a persona it's not an act it's not a costume it's not anything like that it's not an alter ego it's just who I am and that's why I transitioned so like some of the language they're using is definitely raising some flags of like if this is how they felt the whole time like right from before they started like physically transitioning and everything hypothetically I'd say like it was inevitable they would regret it because they are not expressing that they are trans they are expressing that they had a desire to have an alter ego or to look a different way, which is very, very different to being transgender. The more time I spent online, the more it felt like real life. And the more real it felt, which eventually led to me just fully transitioning. So I came out to my parents as Ollie. And, you know, I went to this, I guess, behavioral mental health clinic for like six days. They had a meeting with my parents and they basically told my parents that if you don't validate Oliver, if you don't validate him, then this is just gonna get worse. The best thing that you can do to help him is to accept him as your son. But that is true though. That is what all the evidence suggests. By not doing that, it runs the risk of greatly reducing a trans person's well-being. If you're going in and expressing, the difficulty is there's no scan, there's no blood test, there's, there's nothing like that to determine if somebody is trans. It comes from your description of your experiences and how you're feeling. It does rely on people being honest with those feelings and also seeing doctors who are specialists in understanding the symptoms and knowing the right course of action. If you are going in and you expressing, I'm transgender, I've looked into this, I am a boy, I know who I am, like, the reaction is gonna be 
to parents to validate that, to support that, because to not support that would be pushing you through conversion therapy because you are there presenting and saying that you are transgender. But I already felt like it wasn't what my mom had expected. And for me, transitioning was the closest I could come to without actually doing it. It definitely sounds like there was some comorbidity of mental health issues going on here, which absolutely should have been discussed and explored further alongside discussions of gender identity feelings, because a lot of the language that's being used does not sound like the kind of language that you would be able to go in and use at a gender clinic and then, then diagnose and proceed on to medical steps. It would absolutely lead to more investigations of what else is going on, let's have some further discussions. With all of these mental struggles that I was having, not knowing how to make sense of it on my own, and consuming so much of the trans narrative, and just love and life, hearing people say this made me so much happier, this alleviated my pain. I wanted to alleviate my pain. I also didn't want to be who I was. So with transitioning, I could do both of those things. I could alleviate my pain and I can become someone else. I wanted to escape my own identity as Daisy. The more that they're talking, the more it sounds like they were not trans. And I don't know how a doctor dealt with this because the, like, the thing is, in any medical field, there are bad eggs right? There is going to be mistakes made, there's going to be wrong decisions, there's going to be doctors who just do not do the right thing or know the right thing, and that can happen within gender identity fields of medicine as well. Nobody's trying to deny that, but what we then need to do is do better within those medical fields and with the doctors and training, etc., not punish the 99% of people where it was absolutely the right thing for them to do. Trans people who have no regrets get mistreated within the medical field a lot as well and it's never an exploration of right let's make medicine better let's make healthcare better for trans people or for people with questions over their gender identity who want support with that it's always instead let's stop people from transitioning and that is not the right approach it should absolutely be going to the healthcare side of things and improving that my name is Ali Chadra and this is my voice one day before testosterone. It's all very dark and sad. <laughs> like, yeah, the tone is interesting. That was really the beginning. I wasn't just playing around anymore. I wasn't just playing dress up anymore. Like I was actually going to become a trans man and live my life that way. Culturally, we are Mexican and men have to be very masculine in our culture. And I wasn't the most masculine growing up and I think that had a part on everything that eventually led me to do what I did. It was around middle school. I was surfing YouTube one day and a video popped up male to female. And that eventually planted the seeds of doubt and allowed me to be caught by the ideology that eventually led me to hurt myself. Ooh, okay. It's so tricky because I, I have sympathy for people who have gone down the wrong path in life for whatever reason, whether it's because of medical malpractice, whether it's because of them just not explaining their feelings right. I'm not trying to put blame on that, but just any kind of combination of things. I do feel sympathy, but at the same time, it baffles me that people then turn around and go, oh, it was wrong for me, so therefore you can't do it. Where where else do we see that within the medical field? There is a average 14% regret rate across all like surgeries within medicine. That is significantly higher than the 1% regret rate for trans-related surgeries and, and medical treatment. And we don't see people turning around saying, oh, nobody should ever get a knee operation or a hip replacement. It's a, I had a hip replacement and I was one of those people where it didn't go right or it wasn't the right course of action. The doctors made an error with this, blah, blah, blah. But with 
transition related things we see this fairly regularly or at least these are the people that are highlighted of like hey i did this thing and it wasn't right for me therefore i don't think it's right for anyone else and i'm going to go so far as to say that it's an ideology and this group of people shouldn't access it and this thing is dangerous and call people who share their stories online groomers like it's quite an extreme reaction eventually I just wanted an answer to be given to me on who I was and I went to see a therapist and I had only asked, I think I might be trans, I don't know, I want to know. The therapist immediately on my first appointment with her said, yes I am a transgender woman. She had my letter to transition the same appointment. After that, I just took everything slowly. But eventually my father found out what I was doing. And due to our culture, he was not happy. And he took me to Mexico and had me have a relationship against my will. It was a I was a 19 year old kid. Well, that is horrendous. Oh my God. And my father told him, take good care of him. It's his first time. He was trying to prove that I was a man. That broke me, obviously. After that, I go back to the therapist and told her I wanted to transition. And she recommended I start my social and medical intervention as soon as I can. 11 months after I had started hormones, I was transferred to another medical professional who, after speaking with him for one time only, he approved me for surgery. And a few weeks after that session, I got two letters from my insurance proving me for surgery. That is uh, unusually quick. Like, so the process in the UK is you would have, <laughs> you'd be on a very long wait list before you had your first appointment for and like speaking about anything, like let alone starting hormones. And then you would need at least one more appointment, like two specialist sign offs before you could start hormones. And then you would also need two referrals. Like, so for my lower surgery, despite the fact I've been on hormones for several years, I had top surgery several years ago as well i was required to have one appointment with one specialist and have their interpretation and their sign off and referral and then wait and then have a second appointment with a second specialist doctor to give me a second referral and there had to be two of them i think this person just sounds like they went through a very very difficult time that nobody deserves to go through but i was a little surprised that i received my letter for bottom surgery which was removal of my genitals without even asking. If that is the pro- see, that's the difficult thing. If, the, if that's the exact process that this person experienced, then it sounds like some questions went unasked and unanswered and it was potentially too fast for them. It's hard to know if they were showing any hesitancies or what was, or what was said by them specifically in these appointments, but Again, just because it's trans related doesn't mean there can't ever be medical malpractice and wrong decisions made by the medical professionals. That sucks. That's so unfair. That's incredibly shit for the people that experience it. At the same time, it does not negate the experiences of trans people or the right for trans people to access healthcare. Like, why are we go? Why are we looking at a case of potential medical bad acting and kind of wrong decisions made that affected somebody's life? And instead of saying, let's pursue whoever did this and let's work on making the medical field better for gender identity and transition related things, <laughs> why are we instead going, I guess, let's stop all people transitioning? Like there are lots of doctors out there who are amazing and will absolutely do the correct thing and will refer people who require referrals and will not refer people who, where it's not the right thing for them to do. It's a tricky discussion because there is sympathy, but at the same time, I'm 
not understanding why the anger isn't towards the specific doctors who made errors or the specific individuals who were potentially lying. I'm not saying the people in this documentary were, but it has happened before that people who detransition later reveal that they lied in their appointments deliberately to try and access hormones and transitioning quicker. Why are we not having discussions about that? <laughs> the automatic thing is just therefore being trans and transitioning is bad for everybody and all people. It's a bit of a massive jump. My name is Ali Chadra. This is my voice pre T. My name is Ali Chadra, and this is my voice one month on T. Two days ago was my official three months on testosterone. This is my voice four months on T. It's probably not really a good thing that I was able to get my hormones so easily. I mean, anyone can go in there. Not only did they send me home with the hormones, but I actually did my very first shot right there in the doctor's office. And I was just euphoric and it was real. How quickly though? I'm not sure if that's been explained. And so far it, has, it hasn't been explained or I've missed it, how old both of these people were when they started this process. And I only know that they were adults at the time they started because I've read multiple articles that have said they were both adults when they started their transition. So I'm not sure like a lot of the information about timeline seems to be missing. And I was actually going to start seeing changes and I was going to start passing, which basically meant that Everyone around me was going to see me as a boy, an actual boy. This feels good. This makes me happy. I'm actually feeling the feelings that, you know, all those like trans people online were saying that they felt. Seemingly out of nowhere, we've suddenly seen a huge spike in media depictions and social media depictions of transgenderism. It's even reached the mainstream advertising world. Transgenderism. Whenever someone says transgenderism, I'm like, this is not going to be good. And I think this is all coming to a head and what this really means for our society. In cases like the case of Layla Jane, a young girl whose breasts were removed at age 13 by doctors who fed her a lie. Take this next case. Layla Jane was born a girl. She Layla Jane experienced a host of medical issues in her youth. Her mother, who is bipolar, expressed to these uh, physicians and therapists that her daughter might be bipolar, but she actually never received any diagnosis or treatment for that. The family went to one physician who, after less than a two-hour appointment, green-lighted the hormone therapy, and in a similarly or even shorter period of time, a plastic surgeon signed off after one visit on removing her breasts. That's the youngest I've ever heard of anything happening. And it is incredibly, incredibly rare for people under 18 to have any kind of permanent treatment. In the UK, it's unheard of that somebody under the age of 18 would have any type of surgery. And it is very, very difficult to access hormones before that age and you would never get them pre-16. To me, this is more a discussion of let's improve healthcare. Let's improve healthcare for trans people and people who want to speak to medical professionals about their gender identity. This is not a reason to be transphobic or bigoted or shut down access to healthcare for trans people altogether. This is a reason to improve it based on these very like rare instances of the wrong thing being done or you know the necessary steps not being taken by one-off medical professionals. This is not an issue of trans people being wrong or transitioning being wrong and I feel like that is a major point being missed in this. Like take any other medical procedure or medical thing, pick out the one-off very very rare instances where medical professionals have made a wrong move and then say okay Okay, no knee replacements for anybody because these three doctors completely fluffed it up once. Like, we wouldn't do that. That's not the attitude we take. It's, I'm not being unsympathetic or heartless towards the people who have received that inappropriate medical care. I just don't think it's appropriate to twist that round and use it as an excuse to be transphobic because they are separate issues. Trans people are not at fault for the rare occasions of medical professionals not doing the right thing. Like most young women who go down this path of identifying transgenderism as the solution to their problems, reinforced by irresponsible medical care providers. It's likely that if physicians had properly diagnosed all of the issues present in Layla Jane as a child, she would never have gone down this path. When parents of trans-identified kids are referred to specialized gender clinics, they're often told that they're going to get comprehensive 
multidisciplinary mental health assessments. We know that that's not true. In practice, these kids were put on a fast track to medical transition. They're making it sound like this is what always happens. It's such an insidious messaging. It's such a dangerous messaging. This is such a completely one-sided view of the rare instances of when it goes wrong. Like literally in 2021, a review of 27 different studies uncovered that just 1% of people over the age of 13 who received gender affirming surgeries experienced regret. And this documentary is making it sound like it is this massive widespread problem with the footage they're showing. Mix this in with footage of trans people who it's genuinely saved their lives, families of trans people, trans supportive marches and protests and advocates for the gender affirmative approach and what they have to say. And it would be a very different picture if you pick one side and you pick the most extreme instances where it's person A's fault that this has happened, it, the fault lies up here, but you twist it so that the fault lies down here. I'm not sure if that's making sense, but it's like where the fault lies either with somebody not being honest about their own feelings or a doctor not behaving appropriately, that's the fault. But you say, no, the fault is on Tumblr and YouTube and trans creators and influencers online and trans people in general, that's the fault. And it's so massively widespread because we're only going to show you these like clips of people who are anti-trans. It really sets a very dangerous impression for people watching this who don't know anything about the process because none of this is trans people's fault. Layla is now 18 and is fighting back. So this does not happen to anyone else. My name is Prisha Mosley. I was a 15-year-old girl when the trans community found me. Already diagnosed with multiple mental illnesses, including anorexia, a body dysmorphic disorder, and borderline personality disorder, a trauma disorder, I was easy to manipulate and convince that I had been born in the wrong body. I was told that this was the reason for all of my mental and emotional distress. The gender specialist I was taken to, taken to see. It's very interesting language i mean like at the end of the day like trans people are the last group of people who would want to convince someone that they're a gender that they're not we know how hard it is to live in a body that doesn't feel right we know how hard it is to be seen as a gender we are not trans people do not want to convince people or manipulate anybody into believing they're trans it's just a case of you share your feelings and if people can relate to that they are going to talk to you like i don't this makes it sound like you know the trans community found me as i like, i think it's probably more like like they found the trans community and I'd be very interested to see like we can only base our opinions on if somebody else is trans or not based on what they're telling us and how they're feeling and without knowing those conversations it's hard to take this off of face value especially given the other attitudes of people in this show. I told my parents that I need to be put on puberty blocking drugs right away. They asked my parents a simple question. Would you rather have a dead daughter or a living transgender son? This is the moment that we all became victims of so-called gender-affirming care. Oh dear. But is this the document we're talking about? You needed this letter signed by a therapist to open up the door for you to, to get these medical treatment. Is, is this the document that we're talking about earlier? Yes, it okay. is. And it took you how long to get this? Oh, uh, 30 minutes. The ideology that has become dominant at these clinics is that trans kids know who they are, and therefore to question them, to ask basic therapeutic questions, like, could your gender dysphoria or gender identity have been triggered by some other event in your life? But that's not the kind of question that is a taboo. There's a very specific diagnostic criteria. Questions are asked, your past is delved into. I remember my own assessments. They were very in-depth and thorough. And it's just, why, why, again, why, why is the trans community being attacked and blamed for this? If you put in a room the people who are speaking out and saying, this was wrong, the doctor did not deal with the mental health issues that I came to them with, and I got my uh, letter within 30 minutes, and then compared it to the people that you put in a room where they're like, no, this literally saved my life. It's incomparable. Like it would be that many people compared to like this many people. And you know, show us the this many people whilst you're talking about this as well to make it clear that it is a specific medical practitioner sometimes being a bad egg rather than there being a problem with a gender affirmative approach because there is not a problem with the gender affirmative approach. Basic questions of screening are completely taboo in these circles. 
But the truth is that parents don't have much of a choice in the matter. And doctors are telling parents in front of their distressed children, if you don't consent to the use of puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones, your child is going to What's expressed is research that clearly shows that for people who are transgender, transitioning is life-saving. And like, that, it's not, it's not a lie, it's not a stretch to express that, that allowing somebody to access healthcare that is appropriate for them is life-saving. <laughs> I believe that most doctors who practice gender-affirming medicine, gender dysphoria, they genuinely, sincerely believe that they're doing good, but they're not. So he believes that most doctors who are practicing gender-affirming medicine are not doing good. So he thinks that this is a widespread thing. So why is there a 1% regret rate then? Why is it not 99%? If most of them are doing bad things, if most of them are wrong, then why is the regret rate percentage the way around it is? And why does every major medical board approve the gender-affirmative approach? Why does every longitudinal study, every meta-analysis, every review, every study point in the direction direction of, yes, the gender affirmative approach is the correct approach to take. Access to hormones, access to being able to socially transition, being accepted, having a open environment where you can explore your gender identity. All of those things reduce gender dysphoria and slash or lead to increased well-being. Why is that the research that we are finding? Why is it the ones that are finding things that do not go with that are either not peer-reviewed or the philosophical pieces that are not based on actual real life research and studies or they are deeply methodologically flawed? Those flawed methodologies are picked up on instantly like in the case of rapid onset gender dysphoria. It does doesn't exist, but the damage is already done. The methodology was poor. When similar studies are repeated with appropriate methodology, there is zero evidence for rapid onset gender dysphoria being a thing. So I'm confused as to how people can sit there and go, most doctors are wrong. They're doing a bad thing. The gender affirmative approach isn't the correct approach. Look at all this harm that's being caused. And it's like, okay, so you're basing that off of a 1% regret rate, also where the biggest reason for detransition and regret is lack of social support, particularly from families. And a lot of people who detransition go on to later transition again when they're in a safer environment. Finland, Sweden, France, Norway, and the UK are reversing course and asking questions. I've all not found enough medical evidence, psychological evidence, to support transgender therapy. In the UK, their only national the clinic for children shut down last year by court order. What do their doctors know that our doctors don't? Part of the problem is that the current cohort of teenagers that are being transitioned under the affirmative protocol. There was an issue because the detransitioner who transitioned like older than they would have been to access the child clinic sued the NHS for it and the clinic temporarily closed its treatment. Like, what I think this person was talking about is it was announced that they would close uh, the clinic, the Tavistock and Portman Clinic, which is the only clinic that would provide gender treatment for under 18s in the UK. But the reasoning is being very twisted. So it stated it was decided that having a single provider of trans youth care across the country wasn't safe or sustainable. Last July, NHS England announced the Tavistock Clinic would be shutting down by spring 2023 to be replaced by at least two regional service centres. The move came after GID was criticised in an independent review led by Hilary Cass, who called for care to become more integrated and more easily accessible. However, as the closure date looms, there are reportedly no location, staff or services yet in place. This has left thousands of trans youth and their families in limbo as the future of gender-affirming healthcare through NHS England. The decision to close GIDS was designed to improve access to gender-affirming care for young people. However, the press have continued to frame the decision as a win in their war on trans lives. So, yeah, sure, the doctors do know something, not getting rid of the gender affirming care model. So it was literally closed to then open up more and be better at providing gender affirming care to young people in the UK. So yeah, let's stop lying about that. Which lacks guardrails, which takes kids at their word when they say I'm trans, which doesn't do proper mental health assessments. In fact, double mastectomies on teenage girls went up 13 fold between 2013 and 2020. Between 2016 and 2019 alone. When they say 13 fold, how many people is that? Is that going from being like two to 26? I'm not sure. 13 fold, 3.7 to 47.7 per 100,000 person. A total of 209 patients underwent gender affirming mastectomy between January 2013 and July 2020. So in seven years, seven and a half years, 209 people underwent 
surgery. I mean, that's rare. <laughs> no, that's an incredibly low number of people. Like, give us the actual numbers instead of being like 13 fold. So I don't really understand what it's trying to say. Because like we see again with like as left handedness became less of a taboo like uh, more people suddenly were like left-handed and it's not because they became left-handed it's not because it became trendy or a social contagion it's just because people weren't forcing people to be right-handed instead or shaming people for being left-handed or it being seen as a bad thing we're seeing the same thing among the trans community we're seeing a uh, supposed increase in the number of trans people when really what's happening is there is an increase in the number of people who are able to figure out their trans because there was no accessible representation before for them to even know why they were feeling the way they're feeling and we're seeing an increase in the number of people who feel able to come out and live as themselves it's not actually increasing the number of trans people just the number of happy trans people who can live as themselves these procedures went up by 500 percent a study published in 2022 by researchers who are advocates of gender affirming surgeries showed that the youngest patient to have received a radical bilateral mastectomy in the United States is 12 years old. These kids are gonna grow up and they're gonna start to feel the full effects of their medical decisions. They're gonna start to feel. 12 years old, let's look into this. So with this study that's just been discussed, I don't know if they're gonna get into it, but I've just had a quick look. And so they were 12 to 17 years of age at the time of referral, not the time of surgery. So I don't know what the difference would be. And then just to the point of like, they'd grow up, there were two patients who had post-operative regret, but neither underwent reversal surgery at follow-up of three and seven years post-operatively. So there were follow-ups of multiple years with these patients. Only two out of the 209 expressed any form of regret. It wasn't described what kind of regret, whether that was regret that they had the surgery, whether that was regret caused by complications, whether that's because they detransitioned and regretted it. It's not explained why, but two out of 209 regretted and neither of those two regrets did anything reversal about it, but I'm sure that they won't tell us that. They're gonna to start to feel the side effects. If you really wanna know whether amputating the breasts of a 12 or 13 year old girl is ultimately in her best long-term interests. Amputating the breasts. So I'm just thinking if the median age was 16, there's probably only one person that was 12. I'm trying to figure out because median is the middle number. So it's the value separating the higher half from the lower half of a data sample. Would that indicate that there were just as many 17 year olds as there were 12 to 15 year olds in this sample? I think Part of this is also veering into the realm of saying like what medical procedures can 12 and 13 year olds have? So the language used is quite divisive in terms of like amputating the breasts. And then this is like, does that mean that 12 and 13 year olds or teenagers generally should never undergo any kind of permanent medical procedure that isn't deemed like an emergency procedure, if you know what I mean? So should we not do anything that would permanently cause some alteration like what what can you do? You can have your ears pinned back in childhood. Lots of other things can happen that aren't necessarily emergency procedures that would lead to a permanent effect on somebody's life. Do they have this same energy about circumcision? No, they don't. And there's also the misgendering. To me, it's just a clear, we don't like trans people. That's what this messaging is. That's what these things are about. It's not having children's best interests at heart. It's not worrying about children undergoing medical procedures when they are younger and how they're going to feel about that when they're older. It's not about children being able to consent to certain medical procedures because again, look at circumcision and then many other medical procedures and under 18s can have types of plastic surgery done as well. It's not anything to do with the actual fundamental things that are happening. It's all to do with it being related to being trans and it, and it being done on trans people or benefiting trans people. It's just like puberty blockers have been used in precocious puberty in cis kids for decades. Nobody gave a shit until they started becoming known as being used to pause puberty for trans kids. So it, people pretend they have an issue with puberty blockers, but really they have an issue with trans kids. That's what it all boils down to, an issue with trans people and people being trans. Ask her when she's 30 or 40 and unable to breastfeed her own child. I mean, you're acting as if everybody's gonna regret it. The statistics would show that 99% will not have any form of regret and you're using female pronouns and assuming 
that they're gonna want to have kids and it's just a very bizarre thing it's such a bizarre thing and it seems so much i can't there's like a phrase for it isn't that i can't remember what it is though it's just this bizarre thing of this guy sitting there and going oh it's so sad that a woman's breasts have been removed However, will she breastfeed her children? And it's like, one, not women, not a woman. Two, not everybody wants to have kids. Three, none of your business. Four, <laughs> oh. I would go out into the world and everyone's calling me Ollie. Everyone sees me as a guy. But then at the end of the day, when I'm home, in my room, looking in the mirror, I'm like, What did I do? Like, I start getting these, like, really scary thoughts of, like, you're incomplete. You're not a guy. You never will be. But even though you're legally, you know, your driver's license says you're a guy, you know you're not. Was that internalized transphobia or, like, a genuine kind of, I have not done the right thing here? I'm not saying either way. I don't know. Your body image issues are worse. That's not supposed to happen. What do we do now? I just woke up one day, looked at myself in the mirror, and asked myself, what the heck am I doing? As I realized, no matter if I would have gone every surgery, continue with hormones, I realized I would have never been a woman. At best, I would have been a caricature of what I believed a woman was. See, that's so interesting to hear. That sounds like it could be internalized transphobia, that sounds like it could be messaging from the outside world that's gone through, it could be instances of realizing that it was never a case of them feeling like they were a man or a woman, but thinking life might be better if they were, and then transitioning. It's very confusing because I've never ever heard a trans person describe things in that way, to like a trans man to stand up and go like, no, I, I know I'll never be a man, because like, <laughs> trans men are men, trans women are women, regardless of genitals and regardless of chromosomes and all of this stuff, intrigues me that that, that both of them have echoed the same feelings of like, oh no, I, I've gone so far in this process and I'm realizing that it's not made me a, a quote unquote real man or real woman. And that doesn't sound like it's coming from a place from people who are trans because that's not an opinion that's held by the trans community and is just kind of like objectively incorrect about gender identity and, and, and trans people's gender. So that's really interesting and I wonder where that's coming from. Nobody would help me because they had more concerns of me reversing everything. I just socially detransitioned, got the implants removed, so I had technically developed gynecomastia. My chest is not like it used to be, and it never will. I have scarring, numbness, and unfortunately, my nipples are completely different, eh, to put it lightly. It has been taking a major toll on me since I realized what I've done. See, I feel like people who do transition because they were never trans in the first place, like, this guy's probably experiencing elements of what it feels like for trans men. It looks like he had double incision top surgery, which is what I have. I have scarring. I have areas where sensation is lower than others, and my nipples look different to how they did before. But to me, that's something that is like, would I have preferred to have just had a like a cis guy flat chest? Yes, that would have been easier. But I don't, so what I have now makes me significantly happier than what I had before. It's just, it's just a different framing, and like the way they're both talking about it just feels like they weren't trans. I'm not here to diagnose anybody. It sounds like there's transphobia going on in their thought process, there's obviously regret over what they've done, and it's difficult to tell if that's internalized transphobia, and they've just kind of been fed so much like you're never going to be a, a real man or whatever that it's made them go well what's the point or if that's a genuine belief of like trans people are not really their gender so what the hell am i doing here i was never this in the first place i was almost five years on testosterone so if i had gone further i, I wouldn't have been able to go back when i found out i was pregnant i was just over the moon i mean i i was scared i was gonna have a doctor tell me that like, sorry, you're infertile. 
and it would have been my fault. It's unlikely that testosterone will cause like total infertility and permanent, like a majority of people will be able to come off testosterone and have a baby if there was no issues present beforehand. There are so many young people who are going through very similar things that I did and are still being told that transition will save them and it's just not true. But it is for the trans people. The only people who are being told transitioning is an option that could potentially greatly improve your life are the people who are trans. If you are trans and you have gender dysphoria, then transitioning in some way will almost certainly improve your life in some way. Whether that's socially transitioning or medically transitioning or both is highly likely to have a positive impact on your life because both things for trans people reduce gender dysphoria, which increases well-being in its itself and generally increase well-being as well independently of gender dysphoria. I think it's a very one track perspective to sit there and go I did this thing and whether it was through fault of their own or fault of the medical people around them specifically they have regretted it and it was not the right thing for them to do. Like sure that happened to you that is not a fun thing to experience deserve support and help with that and there is nothing wrong with your journey and there is no judgment on your journey but i then think it's incredibly unfair to twist their individual experiences and project that onto an entire community where literally 99 percent of the people who go through the same journey as them have zero regret and have had their lives greatly improved my story is tragic in some ways but it's very redemptive in many ways that cannot be said for many detransitioners and that's just heartbreaking like i can't imagine living with that like, I can't imagine what it would be like to regret a bottom surgery or, you know, to, to be infertile because when you were a, a little child, like 12, your, you know, parents were manipulated into putting you, like blocking your puberty. Sure, feel sympathetic for the 1% who have gone down the wrong path. Don't then project it onto the 99%. Have that as a separate conversation of like 1% of the time, this is not the right thing for people to do. And we deserve support and our own community and help with this and help to process it and all of this stuff. Fine. But don't then in the same breath turn it on to and this should not be happening and the the parents are being manipulated and the people who transition are being manipulated and gender affirmative care is wrong no because they're two separate groups of people one of which very much deserves access to gender affirmative health care and support with that and one that very much deserves support with the path they have gone down as well. It's not an argument to get rid of gender affirmative healthcare. Like, it's, it's just bizarre. Being so young, I was so impressionable. I was told so many times, it's possible that you're trans, it's possible that you're trans, that eventually I started to believe it. Unfortunately, transition made things worse for me. It has just kind of wrecked my perception of myself, and I feel like I missed out on like three years of my life. I missed out on three years of living my teenage girlhood. I feel like I missed out on 17 years. <laughs> Yay! I wish I had known when I was younger. I am 30 years old now. I've been transitioning for over 13 years and oh my god has my life greatly improved. But I also have this sense of loss. So have that for yourself. Hold that for yourself. Recognize the journey you've been on. But do not try and force people to have that same experience as you from a different lens. Like, I feel like we should be able to understand each other better. Yeah, I know what it feels like to feel like you've missed out on years of the life you, you feel you should have lived. I get that. It's just from a different perspective. Like, I would never say, oh, I think care for detransitioners should be cancelled. No. Why Why are you giving them support? I'd never say that. So I don't know why there's a whole bunch of detransitioners who are coming out and saying, no, this is wrong. Look at how horrendous it was for me. It's going to be horrendous for you. Don't let anybody do this. I didn't realize that there were women like me who were different. So here's the deal. I'm detransitioning. It's true. It's not a joke. I understand now that I can be a cis woman again. I haven't gone too far. I haven't passed the point of no return. I can live as a woman again. Of course, 
there's there's no point of no return that's like saying that trans people could never live as their gender because like a trans woman who starts transitioning at 30 no past the point of no return too late that's not true there's always a possibility to live as yourself I, I think it's just obviously unfortunate for these people that they had to go through an experience that was wrong for them but it's also unfortunate for trans people that access to healthcare is constantly trying to be shut down for one reason or another. I was something because people were reacting to me, but it was a me that wasn't really me, so I was protected. I was protecting myself with the trans label. These pediatric clinics that perform these surgeries, they will do nothing to help. <laughs> I feel like any shred of credibility that they didn't have but they may have been seen of having with this documentary has now just been destroyed by having a clip of ollie london at the end somebody who identified as transracial and just has had every argument that they have against trans people absolutely obliterated why would you do that to you i mean it was not a good documentary in the first place but then to put ollie london at the end Wow. <laughs> These teens, if they decide to detransition, there's nothing you can do. You know, once you've taken all those hormones, Billy, your body is changed beyond repair. Beyond repair. And it's just like the 99% where I feel like I've said that so many times, but it's because people don't seem to understand it. It's not a compassion Olympics, but there seems to be no care given over the literal vast majority of people where this is right for them. And also these are the people like people like Ollie London, who sat there going, all these hormones that have caused permanent changes, you're never gonna be the same, blah, blah, blah. Are then saying, no, trans kids shouldn't have access to puberty blockers. So you're wanting to push trans kids through this process that you've literally just sat there and said is really difficult to go through. Okay. You don't have to remove your body parts to make you complete. When I transitioned, my ideation did not go away. Transition is not the only answer, and there are many detransitioners like me out there. My name is Camille Keeple. My name is Emily. My name is Laura Becker. My name is Abel Garcia, and I am a detransitioner. My name is Daisy, and I am a woman. Well, that was it, and that was very interesting. It feels like they got two people who transitioned in adulthood who shared very similar views of like, I didn't hear at any point, particularly with Daisy, saying that they felt they were a man for the other person in the documentary, they felt they were a woman. I don't feel like there was that sentiment. And that is literally what is in, like, the, if you go through the diagnostic criteria, I feel like the way they describe it now, like, they would not be diagnosed as having gender dysphoria or being trans. And then at the end saying that both of them, it was just very bizarre, they both had this exact same sentiment of like, it's like they reached a certain point in their transition and just went, well, I'm never going to be a real man or woman. What's the point? That's what it felt like. And it's difficult to know where that comes from without it being expanded on further. And I just think overall, like, again, do a documentary about detransitioners. The fact that there is a documentary called Detrans is not in of itself a problem. The problem is the messaging behind it of it being an attack on the trans community, an attack on the 99% where this is the right path, and an attack on the gender affirmative approach that is approved by medical boards, is approved by research, and has a strong body of evidence behind it. And all of that is just being ignored. Even with the study that they picked that they were like, oh yeah, this kind of like proves our point because look, here's a, here's a 12 year old. That was the youngest age. They completely omitted the actual figures they just said 13 fold they didn't say 209 teenagers in seven and a half years have had this surgery that is a very very small number of people and then they also didn't state that despite there being like multiple years of follow-up of the people in this study only two people showed any kind of regret that's such a big thing to leave out if you're gonna bring up a study discuss it it's like picking and choosing and showing one very specific perspective you're always going to be able to fear monger with this type of thing you're always going to be able to say oh look how dangerous it is look we've gathered five detransitioners to give a little statement at the end of our documentary that featured two and it's like i'm pretty sure they featured just randomly more happy trans people and clips of trans people some of which I recognized as being very very happy with their transitions they featured more people like that in the documentary without even trying than they did detransitioners long story short detransitioners are not a threat to the trans community the gender affirmative care is the appropriate method of healthcare for trans people it does not mean that there is never 
a doctor who does something wrong or somebody that goes in and misrepresents how they're feeling and receives care that they should not receive or does not receive care that they should have received instead. Detransitioners should not be weaponized against a trans community and the only time the trans community has an issue with detransitioners is when they make documentaries like this and are just kind of spurting transphobic rhetoric about manipulation and gender affirmative approach being dangerous and social contagions and all of this kind of thing and it's this very one-sided view that is given and why are we attacking still the trans community and the gender affirmative approach when we should be addressing any individual doctors who do something wrong just like we should be doing in any field of medicine and I can't say for sure where the errors were made with the people in this documentary you can it's impossible to tell without having been a fly on the wall or see transcripts of conversations or exactly what went down we're only hearing one side of the story we're not hearing what the doctors have to say who treated these patients so there's no way of knowing if the doctors made an error and behaved inappropriately or if the people themselves going in were misjudged or missed out things that they should have informed doctors about it's very difficult to tell but either way people who detransition because they are not transgender are separate to trans people and just because we have a small portion of people who detransition in society does not mean that the majority of people who transition and it greatly improves slash saves their lives does not mean that their access to that healthcare should be denied or made harder or gotten rid of altogether. Yeah, I think just put the logic on any other field of medicine and it seems bizarre that one person would have a problem with a tooth filling. I know I know it's a bigger deal than a tooth filling, but one problem would have a problem with a tooth filling and be like, nobody should get their teeth filled ever. No, no dentists. It's just like you have an issue with the dentist and you you had a bad dentist. You had an accident happen during the dentist. I don't know what I'm going on about dentists. Yeah, in some ways it wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be, but in other ways it was worse because it was insidious transphobia. It was the dangerous kind that people watching it very innocently and just not knowing anything would be completely sucked in by the emotive stories and the one-sided view and approach given in this documentary. But on one hand, it was easy easier to watch because it wasn't just filled with like abhorrent transphobia that was very very obvious it was still abhorrent but it was like <laughs> very quiet it was not in your face but actually the more you think about this kind of thing the worse it is than something that was just absolutely awfully in your face I would prefer that because at least more people would be able to recognize that it is transphobia and that it is wrong and that it is not representative of the trans community or the positives of the gender affirming approach. It's this whole rapid onset gender dysphoria narrative woven into stories designed to bring out emotions and sympathy in people. Then it's like, and this is what's wrong with the trans community and trans people transitioning and don't bring adults onto a documentary or people that transitioned in adulthood into a documentary where you're then going on and on and on about children having access. We've seen the rates of regret are incredibly low and that wasn't even discussed once. You'd think in a documentary that covered regretting transitioning they would cover the number. If that was a selling point and it's like oh so many people and it's because it's not there isn't a uh, there isn't like a gotcha with the figures or the stats so they have to rely on one-off stories and lies in and around that story great horrible absolutely horrible that so much ad spend was put behind this and so many people would have seen it but honestly this is not representative of the trans community or the gender affirmative approach uh, and i would encourage people to go and watch something that is a lot more balanced and that also provides facts and the truth about what it's like to transition and the evidence-based stuff. So yeah, thanks for watching this very long video. I think it's probably gonna be a long one. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. And yeah, as always, thank you so, so much for watching. I'll see you next time. Much love, bye.